Hey there, BookTube. Noah. Everyone who reads It Must Converse is the channel. Thanks for coming back by again. Today I'm talking about a what I consider a special book, and it is surreal and very unique in the way that it it is the story is told and things like this. This is my first Richard Browdigan novel. This is In Watermelon Sugar. Browdigan was part of of the Beats, lumped into that kind of movement, the Beat poets, uh, Kerouac, Allen Ginsberg, people like that, um, but came a little bit after, and I think that he gained something by being a little later in the movement like that. Maybe it's just his voice, because the voice, the voice of the author in this book is special and beautiful. It's very delicate and very tender. And I've been reading a lot of uh, novels that kind of feel like this lately, Un unknowingly, uh, just uh, coming into contact with newer writers, new writers to me, Louise Erdrich, um, Toni Morrison as well, have this kind of very, very gentle voice in what they're saying, even though the subject matter may be shocking. This book is, I wouldn't say is shocking. There is some shocking, there is a shocking scene and there is some kind of things where you're you're going to you're going to mull over it for a while and wonder what does it mean and you might be wondering what it all means this is a very surreal novel and it is a utopian novel in a way you're kind of in a post-apocalyptic world or an alternate uh future where there's a society built and it's a kind of communal society, and it seems like a very utopian place to live. Everybody is very happy, everybody works together, and our narrator does not have a name. Many people uh, in this commune are nameless, and some do have names. Not really, uh, things are not explained in this book in a way of saying, well, this is why we do it this way, but this is why we do it that way. And also, the overwhelming amount of watermelon sugar that is used to build things out of. There are different types of watermelons in this world. There's different types of suns, a different well, ways that the sun shines to create different types of watermelons. And they use the different sugars distilled from these watermelons to, to build things. What does it mean, right? Uh, you know, building a glass or building houses or building objects out of watermelon sugar. Something that is organic and something that would, would, would just break down, you would think, in the rain. Things like this. But they live in a place called Eye Death. And there, there is, there, you know, it seems like the people that live there don't really understand what Eye Death is. Or what death means, that word. But they're no uh, stranger to death. Of course, they're human beings, so everybody has a, a lifespan, things like this. But they have rituals. They have um, this whole kind of s culture built up that is different than our own. But you see uh, a place called the Forgotten Works. So there's a place where there is just, they call, the narrator calls them forgotten things. And we get a sense, or you get a sense as a reader, that these forgotten things are from the time past that nobody has an idea of what the things even are or what their purpose might serve. But there's a group of people that kind of reject the utopian society as there would be, right? And think that, well, these people are misguided they're, you know, limited in the way that they are living their life, and I'm not going to live like that. And they embrace a kind of a chaotic lifestyle. Um, the way that it plays out is shocking. But I, I'll say that when it comes down to it, I think it's kind of a commentary on utopia, on a utopian ideas. Um, of course, the beats and these kind of, uh, the hippie movement, these kind of things is going towards... Uh, wanting a better society, right? And something like a utopian society would be uh, w what they would try to try to create, something like a Skinner, right? So we have a utopian society, but we also have some commentary about that society and the ways that this plays out. Like I said, 
um, when it comes down to how it is delivered, it is very subdued, very plain speaking, straightforward and subdued. So you get a sense that, and, and the commentary pushes you to think that this society uh, might, it strikes the modern reader as people who are just all on Prozac, you know, just all like, okay, whatever, you know, no big deal. They just do this or do that. If something crazy happens, it's like, well, that just happened. Let's, you know, we're going to do this because of it or that. And it's, you get a sense of people who are um, kind of alienated from some aspect of humanity. What aspect that is, 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 is up to you as a reader to figure out. But I really did enjoy it. I, I loved parts of this book and the book as a whole. It's very short and really enjoyed my experience. I will be reading more Brown again. I have a, a, a book that has three of his novels in one. So I think I'm just going to jump into it. 140 pages. You can't um, go wrong with this one. And I'll give you a little bit because I think it does good for the review. And I couldn't, you know, kind of let it be known. I can't put it out there in my own words. We'll, we'll just let Broutigan do it. So this is very, very short chapters, 140 pages and probably, you know, 60 to 80 chapters. So a page or a, even a half page like this per chapter and it just flows and I do recommend it. So this is from a chapter called My Name. It's very, very early, probably the, the first or second chapter in the book. My Name. I guess you're kind of curious as to who I am, but I'm one of those who do not have a regular name. My name depends on you. You just call me whatever is in your mind. If you're thinking about something that happened a long time ago, somebody asked you a question and you didn't know the answer, that's my name. Perhaps it was raining very hard, that's my name. Or somebody wanted you to do something and you did it. Then they told you what you did was wrong, sorry for the mistake, and you had to do something else, that's my name. Perhaps it was a game that you played when you were a child or something that came idly to your mind when you were old and sitting in a chair near the window. That's my name. Or you walked someplace and there were flowers all around. That's my name. Perhaps you stared into a river. There was somebody near you who loved you and, you were, and they were about to touch you. You could feel this before it happened and then it happened. That's my name. Or you heard someone calling from a great distance. Their voice was almost an echo. That's my name. Perhaps you were lying in bed, almost ready to go to sleep, and you laughed at something, a joke, unto yourself, a good way to end the day. That's my name. Or you were eating something good, and for a second you forgot what you were eating, but still went on knowing that it was just good. That's my name. Or you were, uh, perhaps, it was around midnight, and the fire tolled like a bell inside the stove. That's my name. Or you felt bad when she said that thing to you. She could have told it to someone else, somebody who was more familiar with her problems. That's my name. Perhaps the, tr the trout swam in the pool, but the river was only eight inches wide, and the moon shone on eye death, and the watermelon fields glowed out of proportion, dark, and the moon seemed to rise from every plant. That is my name. So you can see uh, from the language, it's very, very tender. And there is perceptive uh, imagery there. There's a lot of symbolic elements to this book. And I think it, uh, it will be enjoyable for most people. If you're not down for surrealism, abstract reading, then this is not something that is for you. But if you like that kind of thing and, and uh, want to get deeper into it, I think this is a very good place to start with Broud again. And um, catch on the next one, BookTube. Leave me any comments about anything, um, if you've read it or anything like that. Bye-bye.